as we prepare for Christmas, there is just so much to do, isn't there? Presents to be ordered, food to prepare, trees to trim. But there is also another kind of preparation that calls out to us. Seek joy. Do not be afraid. Listen to the children and believe. Who will show us the way? The Holy Family? Perhaps a prophet? Maybe even a child? Let us turn our hearts and our minds to the wonderful mystery of God. Anticipating what is to come like a child as we light our Advent wreath through worship and wonder. This is the season of Advent, the time when we get ready to celebrate the mystery of Christmas, the time when we're all on the road to Bethlehem. But who will show us the way? The prophet shows us the way. The prophet is someone who listens to God to show us the way to Bethlehem. This is Isaiah. Isaiah listened to God and said, The Messiah is coming. The Messiah will bring light to our darkness. He said, The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have dwelt in deep darkness, on them the light will shine. This is the light of the prophet. And it reminds us to listen to the prophets so we will know the way to Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph can show us the way. They have a secret. An angel appeared to them and said, Do not be afraid, but be of great joy, for you shall have the special Son of God, and you will name him Jesus. Here is Mary and Joseph and their donkey on the way to Bethlehem. Let us enjoy the light of peace.
As we go to God in prayer this morning, we have several uh, prayer concerns to lift up. This morning, we pray for Nathan Lipscomb, who will have surgery on December the 11th. It's quite extensive, and he'll be in the hospital for a while following that. Um, Nathan, we're praying for you um, as you undergo this surgery. Also this morning, uh, I want to lift up Jimmy Goodnight. Uh, he found out that there are additional spots on his liver and will be figuring out treatment options in the days ahead. Uh, we surround Jimmy and Brenda with our prayers, and Jimmy, we know how very strong you are. This morning, we lift up uh, the family and all who love Tony Lamb. Um, my favorite memory of Tony was when he played the harmonica um, in worship one week. It was so amazing to see. Uh, he just had an unstoppable spirit. Tony died of COVID on November 24th, and uh, we will miss Tony, but I'm so grateful um, that Patty is there in the COVID unit um, and is able to pray with our people um, in their last days. Kim Somerville is back home after spending several days in the medical center due to a bowel obstruction, but we continue to pray with you him. And finally, my grandfather, my grandpa Julius, passed away this last week. He was 100 years old, married to my grandma for 60 years in October. These last few months have been exceptionally difficult as my grandpa, for almost all of his life, he didn't slow down. Until these last few months, grandpa had to move into a nursing home and my grandma wasn't allowed to see him until he went into hospice care. But um, my grandpa passed after my aunt, who was a beautiful singer, sang him Ave Maria, and my grandma read him the 23rd Psalm. And so I give thanks for his incredible life and for the love he and my grandma shared. And I appreciate your prayers, especially for my grandma. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, as we gather with you in prayer during Advent, remind us that this is a season of expectation. We, your church, are anxiously awaiting the arrival of your Son, Jesus Christ. But right now, we're also anxiously awaiting many other things. A return to normal, a vaccine, and even the opportunity to just gather together again as a church. Please give us the patience and the knowledge that these things will come, just as your Son came. Please be with those who may be feeling anxious, isolated, alone, or even hopeless during this season that we usually gather together so often. Be with our healthcare workers and other essential employees as they work and sacrifice their own health to keep us safe and healthy. Let us also pray for our homeless brothers and sisters during this, the coldest time of the year, and let us provide for them food, shelter, and warmth. And also please pray for anyone who has any other prayer concerns, spoken or unspoken, acknowledged or unacknowledged. We thank you for our church community and the larger community here in Bowling Green for doing what we can in your name to provide for those less fortunate than us. Let us keep that work up with a renewed spirit as we go into this Advent season. Keep all of us, your sons and daughters, safe until we can gather to a uh, until we can gather again in person in your name and remind us to practice. Even in this time, we, might, we must be a part fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ as we pray the prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I left off one of my notes for us to pray about this morning. Um, I was asked to lift up that December 1st was World AIDS Day, and so today we remember all those lost to this disease and all those who are living with it. Let us listen now. For the word of God spoken through the prophet Isaiah, 
chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their consistency, their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will, flee, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. This is the word of God, and in it we can trust. This morning, I want to share with you a story about a little girl that is adapted from a sermon by Reverend Dr. Fred Craddock. Many of you are likely familiar with that name. Jim is in here chuckling because sharing a story by Dr. Craddock, I do it with fear and trembling because I would call the late Reverend Craddock the patron saint of disciples preaching. Short in stature, but a true giant in the pulpit, Reverend Craddock quite literally wrote the book on preaching. One of the great honors in my life happened when I was an intern at Week of Compassion, helping with an event called Weekend of Compassion, and Reverend Craddock was scheduled to preach. I was assigned the task of getting him set up to preach in worship following dinner, and so I left the Scarrett Bennett Retreat Center cafeteria early and was asked to retrieve a small stool that he would stand on so that he could see over the pulpit. I was both terrified and thrilled all at once to meet him. But his impression on me wasn't actually through his words, though beautiful they were. No, it was that stool that he stood on. You see, a few months earlier, I had been assigned as an intern to preach about Week of Compassion in a congregation outside of Indianapolis. When the worship leader met me, he asked if I would like to use a small stool so that I could see over the pulpit. Now, my young, proud seminary self was incensed. I had worn my high heels, after all. Why should he point out my short 
stature in the first five minutes of meeting me anyways. I politely declined his offer and ended up standing on my tippy toes throughout my sermon, my calves cramping by the end of it. But fast forward a few months, and there I stood with Reverend Fred Craddock, him requesting a stool to stand on. I think I may have blushed as I scurried to find it. I wouldn't realize it right then, but over time, I would recognize this as a God moment. Right there, in a plain old conference room, there was my God. Now, it may have been because my mentors, Reverend Amy Gopp and Johnny Ray, they never sat me at the kids' table during my internship, but instead they gave me the freedom to try new things and to be in the room where some of the greats, like Dr. Craddock, stood. So maybe it wasn't quite so dramatic, but it was almost as if God tore open the heavens and came down to teach me that, yes, Actually, good news can come from small places. There is no need to hide or minimize the fullness of who we are in body or in spirit. If Reverend Craddock could preach from a stool, then certainly I could too. Since then, I have baptized young people while standing on a crate nailed to the floor of the baptistry in Paris, Tennessee. I have prayed through a megaphone while standing on a box, and I have even preached standing on a stool. Because, yes, good news can come even from unexpected sometimes even small places. The prophet Isaiah reminds us in the assigned lectionary text for this morning that God often chooses the least expected places to arrive. When Isaiah commands us to make straight a desert highway for our God, he is precisely pointing out the absurd places that God so often chooses to show up. I mean, obviously, highways, as we know them, weren't a thing in antiquity, but there were paths where people traveled. These roads, though, they weren't found in the desert. They would have been near city centers and more populated places. The desert was certainly no place for a highway. And yet, when Isaiah offers this profound word of hope, he describes something emerging where nothing should. He is speaking to an exiled people, an exhausted people, a people who are ready to just go home. Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says your God, he declares. A highway in the desert is a striking image that would have stirred up in these exiles the possibility of hope despite all odds to the contrary. I was listening to the news on my way to work the other day, as I often do, and I heard, like I really heard this time, I think I've been shutting it out, that the previous day's death toll from the coronavirus in the United States had surpassed 3,000 people. How could this be? Where could hope 
possibly be found in a moment such as this. It is almost as if we must shut off some of these rattling statistics because if we didn't, surely none of us could breathe. But the good news that Isaiah proclaims to the people of God is that we do not have to hide from our reality. That right in the desert, amidst a pandemic, like just think of the worst possible case scenario, right there we build an interstate for our God who will come, as Reverend John Wesley reminded us, in his devotion this week, not just in the majestic mountains, but through a baby of all things. Think of small things, John said, like bottles and diapers and sleepless nights. So Reverend Craddock tells a story about this little girl who attended church all by herself. He said that her parents were sort of upwardly mobile and they didn't have time for things like Sunday morning worship. They often had parties late into the night on Saturdays And so they would simply drop her off at the church door and go back to their busy, important lives. That was until one day when the preacher looked up and saw two adults sitting with the little girl. And during the invitation, those two adults came forward to join the church Afterwards, the preacher asked those two adults, who turned out to be the little girl's mom and dad, what it was that made them decide to go to worship on that day. And I'll use Reverend Craddock's own words. He said it like this, the mom asked the minister, do you know about our parties? Yes, I've heard of your parties, he replied. She said, well, we had one last night. It got a bit loud, a bit rough, too much drinking. It woke our daughter up, and she started to come downstairs. She was on the third step, and she saw the eating and the drinking and the people gathered, and she said, oh, can I have the blessing? God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our food. Good night, everybody. And she turned around and went back upstairs. The mom said that people began to say, well, it's been a good night, and started to leave. In about two minutes, the room was empty. Mom and dad picked up crumbled napkins and spilled peanuts, half-eaten sandwiches, took empty glasses and trays into the kitchen. They looked at each other, and the mom said they were both thinking, God had come for them, inviting them home, inviting them to discover what their lives had been missing, the peace that passes all understanding. Every valley will be raised up and every mountain and hill be flattened. Here is your God, Craddock proclaims in his soft and yet enormous preaching voice. I can just imagine him now standing on that stool larger than life teaching me that God often shows up 
in the most surprising places, through the most unexpected people. A short preacher, a barren desert, a little girl. See, church, here is your God. For a miracle, the heart longs for a little bit of hope will come. Emmanuel, the child prays for peace on earth, and she's calling out from a sea of hurt. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. When we journey together in this season of Advent, we might pray with the psalmist. Show me the path where I shall walk, O Lord. Point out the right road for me to follow. Lead me by your faith and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you, but the Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness. God will show them the path they should choose. Psalm 25. So who will show us the way to Bethlehem? 
Well, Mary and Joseph will show us the way, but it is a journey of mystery. No concrete answers, but abundant in wonder. Two people captured in God's story. To Mary, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. To Joseph, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. What is happening is of God. Mystery and faith are two words we use without much thought. Rather than using faith as a verb, we use it as a noun. Do you have faith? As if it were something we have or don't have. But faith is not presented as a sure thing. Faith is an action in response. Faith is an action in response. Mary and Joseph not having all the answers to this mystery before them responded to the holy presence that invited them to Bethlehem and they will show us the way. Novelist Doris Betts asserts that faith is not synonymous with certainty but it is the decision to keep your eyes open. We come to a table to take bread and cup, remembering that in such simple things, we are invited to God's mystery and invited to respond in faith. Jesus and the disciples gathered for a Passover meal, as Jews today do every year. They gather to remember an old story, slaves in Egypt, Moses delivering them to freedom, a covenant with God, a promised land. It was the supper Jesus began talking about a, a new story. And he took the bread and blessed it and said, this is my body broken and given to you. And he took the cup and blessed it and said, this is the cup of God's mercy and grace given to you. Do this so you remember. Holy God, we walk with Mary and Joseph in mystery and faith to the birth of your living grace in Jesus. Feed us in your new covenant of loving us as your children. May we be nourished so well with your bread and cup that we discover the mystery and the faith to share our bread with those who hunger, to share our cup with those who thirst, to show mercy as you have shown mercy, to be forgiving as you have forgiven. In the joy of this Advent season, may we be bearers of the good news in word and deed so that our world may be healed, redeemed, and revived. Our souls do magnify the Lord, and our spirits rejoice in God our Savior. Amen. This morning you're invited to share communion with those who are with you, saying their name and saying, this is the bread of Christ given to you. And say in the cup, this is the cup of God's mercy and grace poured out for you. And if you live alone, I say to you, sister and brother, this is the bread of Christ. This is the cup of God's mercy and grace given to you. Remember, and God will show us the way to Bethlehem. Megan, the bread, the body of Christ broken for you, the cup blessed, this is the cup of God's mercy and grace given for you. Jim, this is the bread of life and the cup of God's love for you. Thank you.
Thank you, interns. Um, for a moment, I felt like I was in Carnegie Hall. That was so beautiful, and I'm so grateful for you all sharing your gifts. During my morning prayer time about a month ago, I don't know if I came up with the idea or if the idea came and found me for our Advent devotional, but as soon as it popped into my head, I just knew we had to do it. But the idea did not come at a great time. It wasn't uh, enough time to really prepare. Kyle was about to be on maternity leave. She was already working from home. Crystal had tons of extra work to do. Would we be able to recruit writers and get their work back in time to edit and print and mail out 
this big project. That morning, I discussed it with Crystal, and not only did she agree, but she got excited about the project. Then I announced it to you all, and I knew it was going to work, because immediately several of you reached out and volunteered to write. I was especially excited when two of our college students were two of the first people to ask if they could write uh, one of our devotionals. You know how there are some projects where it feels like you're pushing a boulder uphill? Well, this was the opposite of that. It was like we just put the information out into the universe and it instantly started falling into place. I hope you've gotten your physical copy because the book that Crystal put together is beautiful. And I don't know about you, but it makes me feel so much closer to you all by starting out each day looking at each author's picture, then reading the scripture, and then listening for God through you. When things like this come together, it reminds me that even though the church looks different this year, that God is still at work through us. Each of us giving what we uniquely have to give and prayerfully offering it back to God. Thank you to each of you for giving in the unique ways that only you are able to give. And just as a reminder, you can still turn in your pledge cards. We will be meeting next week as a congregation to pass next year's budget, and every pledge helps. Would you pray with me? Thank you, God, for speaking to us through one another. Thank you for planting unique gifts in all of us. God, we pray that in this season of Advent, that we would discover your peace. Amen. Before we go, I have a few announcements to share. Uh, this morning, I'm excited to welcome two new members who aren't really that new to FCC. Welcome to Christina Huddleston and her daughter, Sophia Kopensteiner. Sophia and Christina have been worshiping with us for quite some time. Sophia is active in our youth group, but this week they decided to make their membership official. We are glad to officially call you ours. Also, preparations for Christmas baskets are underway. Our coordinators, the Holians, will be taking inventory this week to see what else we need to shop for. So please turn in your donations by this Tuesday. And Crystal is sharing the slide that lists all the various um, items that we uh, make up the Christmas baskets with. So whatever little bit you want to bring will help us. Also, our angel tree gifts. Just a reminder that those gifts are due back in the office on Monday, December 14th, unwrapped with the tags removed. Thank you to Tammy Davis and Elizabeth Markle for heading this up. And finally, mark your calendars because next Sunday, our congregational meeting will be held following worship at 11 a.m., we will vote on our congregational budget for next year and on elders and deacons and board members. Please plan to join us via the Zoom worship link. Um, when we voted for Daniel to come, we did the same exact format. So we had great participation then. So all you have to do is the exact same thing, the same Zoom link, um, the same way of logging in, the same way of voting. Um, so please make plans to join us next week at 11. We'll try to have a little bit of time um, for everybody to take a deep breath after worship and then get on at 11 o'clock for our meeting. Will you rise for our benediction? <laughs> Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall be made level, and the rough places a plain. Church, not just in the sanctuary or even in a living room perfectly decorated. Not just when things are perfect or even 
normal. Here is your God, church. Go in peace. Amen.